لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ The truth has become absolutely manifest. What that means is the truth has become absolutely clear. The word has become proven itself to be true to the vast majority of them. They still won't believe. فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ And they, they're not going to believe. Allah is saying something just mind-boggling here. He's saying most of them are actually already aware that the word you're saying is absolutely what? True. And they're still not going to believe. In the previous ayah, they have a long history of having no clue. In this ayah, they have every clue. They know. They know. And they still won't believe. But the question arises, if they're not going to believe, what's the point? Why even tell them, you go warn these people and they're not going to believe? Let's start at the top though. How did the truth become absolutely clear to them? There is an undeniable combination. The perfect word of Allah and the perfect character of the Prophet That's how guidance happens, right? Messenger and message. The both of them are at their peak. The greatest messenger and the greatest message ever. Those came together. So even the kafir, the denier, deep down inside knows there's no way we can respond to him. That is in fact the word of Allah. And Allah, I could not have known that, you could not have known that, even the Prophet could not have known that Allah takes a good look inside their hearts and then does a diagnostic analysis and then reveals the ayah, the truth has absolutely become clear, the word has become absolutely true to them deep inside themselves. And, and for most of them that's the case, they already know. They're just not going to believe. Now, isn't it interesting that the Qur'an is enough for the Prophet as a validation? Didn't he validate the Prophet in the beginning? He says, it's not just enough validation for you, it's also validation for them. Don't worry. You don't have to think it's not convincing enough or it's not getting across. It got across. I'm telling you it got across. They're just not letting you see it. Now, the question then, the, the other beautiful thing about this ayah, scary thing too, Allah says they will not believe. Fahum la yu'minun. The word yu'minun is a verb. And when the verb is used, it means it's temporary. Meaning for now they're not going to believe. But eventually, something might happen that they will believe. Now what is that? That's actually an indication in the Qur'an, a, a principle that is mentioned several places in the Qur'an. Please pay attention to it. The stubborn disbeliever who rejects the truth even after knowing the truth, there does come a time when he or she does believe. You know when? When they see the punishment. When they see the punishment, they decide, Inna mu'minun. Like Allah says in Surah Al-Dukhan, Rabba nakshif anna al-adhaab inna mu'minun. Rabb, remove the punishment from us. We're ready to believe. We're ready to believe. Absarna wa sami'na. Farji'na na'mal salihan. We see now. So we're ready to listen. We see, now we're ready to listen. Allah here says, they don't believe for now, almost alluding to the fact that eventually, when they see the punishment, what's going to happen? They will believe. But he tells us other places, Anna lahum dhikra What's the point now? What's the, I ask you to believe in the unseen. Not in, believing in something you can see, even an animal can do. A cat can see a fire and wow. That's, that's not a, an accomplishment. It's not called belief for that reason. So now here he says, they're not going to believe. But then the most important part of this ayah, I held off till the end. I asked you a really hard question. If they're not going to believe, then what's the, what's the point? Why are you telling me to do an impossible job? There's one word in this ayah, one word that answers that question. He says, لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ The truth has become absolutely clear to most of them. And even then they won't believe. If most of them won't believe, then who will? The least of them will, yes? There's a small minority among them who will believe. And I, the Prophet is being told, وسلم, you need to warn all of them because you don't know which ones might believe. And I'll let you know though, most of them won't. It's not called a tough straight path for no reason. Just work with the fact that you're only going to get a few. And I'm not even going to tell you who they are. If you could just tell me who they are, my job might become easier. I just go after them, don't waste my time with everybody else. Nope, not going to tell you. Just most of them won't believe. And by the way, uh, seriously, they're not going to believe like, how stubborn are they? The next ayah will tell you, إِنَّا No doubt about it, we have put collars, metal collars in their necks. Like a thick collar made of metal, bracelet thingy, like this. And it's got chains on it. When does someone have that? No, more, think more than punishment. Prison. 
This is prison. They've got these guys chained next to each other, one to the next, to the next, to the next. Each one of them has a collar. It goes up to the chin. So this collar is like this, it's up to the chin. And they're walking like this. Then their necks are being held up. That's how, this is an imagery of prison. I want you to remember, this is an image of prison. What does that have to do with this? Allah is not telling you that if you go to the Quraysh, if you go to Abu Jahl right now, you're going to see a collar on his neck and he's going to say, could you please take this off? It's really uncomfortable. No, no, no. Is this a visible or an invisible collar? It's an invisible collar. But you know what? I need you to understand the imagery of prison first. These people are chained, which means they're in prison. And if they're in prison, they are cut off from the outside world, yes? Because when you're in prison, you don't know what's happening where? In the outside world, which means you are unaware, clueless, and heedless. Is there that, is that word already come? Ghafilun. Why are you ghafil? Because you're in prison. And if you have a collar like this, you can't really look around, which means you can't even know what's going on in your immediate surroundings. You're even more heedless, more clueless. And then you have to say that in prison, if somebody gets thrown in prison, you should be able to say, why did they deserve it? Why did you go to prison? In order to go to prison, you have to be charged with a crime, yes? But the ayat before already charged him with a crime. The truth already became clear to him. The word was absolutely manifest to him, to them, and they still didn't believe. That's the crime. And when that's the crime, they should go to prison. But then you don't just go to prison, your punishment should fit the crime. You ever heard this phrase before? The punishment should fit the crime? Now, what, so far what we know about the punishment is he's got a collar right here. On his what? Neck. On his neck. Did Allah say he knows the truth in his heart? Did he allude to the fact that he already knows what's the truth? Yes. He did. So the truth is in his heart, but he's too arrogant to let it out of his mouth. It gets stuck in his neck. It never makes his way to his mouth. He holds it in. That's why they're called a kafir. Kafir means someone who buries the truth. Kafir is also used for a farmer who plants the seed because he buries the seed. So the fact that they keep it under their neck, their neck itself gets locked up. The crime is right here. They could say it, but their pride keeps them. But then you know, I want you to think also about the fact that when you hold your head up like this, and you don't have a collar, what is that? That's pride. The image of a prisoner having his neck up like this is a humiliating image. But Allah compares that head up high with the proud disbeliever who out of his arrogance and his stubbornness and his pride refuses to listen to this message. He thinks that he's being proud. Allah calls his pride a prison. He calls it a prison. He call, he's in prison. He doesn't even know that he's enslaved by his own pride. It's incredible imagery in the ayah. Then last thing about this ayah, when you do have this collar on your neck, can you see yourself? Yeah. Forget being unaware of what's happening outside of prison or around you. You can't even take a good look at who? Your own self. He made them forget themselves. They can't even see their own selves. إِذَا أَخْرَجَ يَدَهُ لَمْ يَكَدْ يَرَاهَا Quran says, if he would take his hand out, he almost can't even see his own hand. This is how bad their situation is. That's how stubborn they are. But their stubbornness, Allah is not... I was, when I read this, I was like, okay, probably Allah is going to move on to the next subject now, because that's enough of a beating. There's another ayah. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدًّا And right in front of them we put a wall. وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا And behind them we put a wall. فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ We covered them. فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ Then they can't see. You're in prison, you're chained to other people, there's a wall in front of you and there's a wall behind you. Why didn't he mention walls on the sides? Because when you're chained you can only move what? And you can't even look around because you have a collar. So all you can see is front and back, that's it. It can get pulled back or pushed forward. That's it. The image is being completed. They are only headed in this direction. Now what did Allah say? There's a wall in front of them and there's a wall behind them. What is the purpose of a wall? You can't escape. The pr another purpose of a wall is you can't see beyond it. Yes? That's what makes you unaware. But there are three blocks. Wall in front, wall behind, and cover on top. This is really, really important. When I say really important two times with saying really, really, that means it's really, really important. If I just say really important, I'm just trying to keep you awake. 
But if I say really, really important, then it's really, really important. Three blocks. The first block was where? Right in front of them. I need you to understand what that means. There's a block right in front of them. You know what's right in front of us? Everything. When I wake up, my house is right in front of me. When I go downstairs, my kids are right in front of me. When I go outside, the sky is right in front of me. When I get in the car, my car is right in front of me. My friends are right in front of me. Quran is right in front of me. All of life, all of Allah's creation is always where? Right in front of me. And that creation, that life, that sky, that earth, that tree, that child, that spouse, they are all reminders of Allah. All of them. But they are blocked from this. So they see all of that stuff, but none of it reminds them of Allah. None of it is enough for them to think. They are blocked from that path to truth. In other words, the first wall is the wall of creation. I want you to understand what that is. Everything Allah created is right in front of us. It's always there. You're not always reading Quran. You're not always doing ibadah. You're not always doing... But you know what? Whenever you're awake, what is always in front of you? Creation is always in front of you. Something to reflect upon with your eyes is always there. That's the first block. The second block is where? Behind them. What is behind us? Our history. My own history. My people's history. My, the history of other nations. That's all where? They don't look at the world around them because of the wall in front of them. They don't even care to reflect upon what happened to people before them. And so they have a block even behind them. Now there's two so far. There's the world around you, number one, and there's history, number two. But then that's not enough. They're blocked somewhere else too. Where? Now We covered them from the top. Now if you block him from the top, there must be something you can learn from the top that may give you the truth. If you pay attention to the world around you, it might lead you to the truth. If you pay attention to history, it might lead you to the truth. And maybe there's something from above that might lead you to the truth. What is that? The revelation of Allah. Now that's blocked from their hearts too. Quran will describe, no matter where you study in the Quran, there are three ways you can arrive at the truth. You can pay attention to the world around you, you can pay attention to history, and you can pay attention to revelation. That is the constant three in the Quran. When you pay attention to yourself, you're paying attention to your, you, you are part of the world around you. سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ The world around you is the first path to truth. Every human being has access to that. History. Those who care to think about history will arrive at the truth. And of course, the most powerful way to the truth is the one that comes from above. These people are completely blocked. So forget about the revelation, they're not listening to the revelation. Before the Prophet was told وسلم, that these people are not gonna listen to you, even if it's Quran, which is from above, that's not their first crime. They don't even pay attention to the world around them. They don't even care about the ruins. They passed by ruined nations, the Arabs used to pass by ruined nations and didn't think twice. What would have happened here? How did they end up like this? They never thought about it. Never occurred to them. Therefore, they're just not going to be able to see. What an image, guys. What an image. And at the end of it all, now the Prophet ﷺ was told, is he going to be able to get the majority or the minority? What was he told? Minority. And now he's being told the majority is so bad, they are so hopeless. It is the same, it won't even matter whether you warn them or not. They're just not going to believe. Ya Allah, you just told me to warn them. And now you say it doesn't even matter if you warn them or not. Yes, a huge population among them, it don't even matter. So if this was a crowd this big, the Prophet was talking to وسلم, the vast majority of them, collars in their necks. The vast majority of them won't pay attention to anything. And he still has to do it. Why though? Why if most of them are not just not going to believe? Not even the Qur'an. Not even the Qur'an from the voice of Rasulullah is enough for them. How stubborn can they be that the Qur'an from the Prophet himself is not enough for them? That's a pretty hopeless state to be. And when that happens, when they're in this hopeless state, the Prophet is then told وسلم, إِنَّمَا تُنذِرُ مَنِ اتَّبَعَ الذِّكْرِ You're only going to be able to follow, to, to warn the one who followed the reminder. Before I tell you about this ayah, I need to tell you one more thing. How many ways to the truth did I say? What were they? What were they? Easy, easy, so super easy. That was really, really important. 
Creation, history, revelation. Yes? Okay. Creation, history, revelation is how you use your mind to arrive at the truth. Once you arrive at the truth, you will benefit from warnings. There's one, two, three, and what's number four? The warnings. If you give warnings before arriving at the truth, it don't mean anything. Sometimes our kids don't know anything about Islam. Why should I pray, mom? Allah will be very angry, but I will be even more angry. Like, you, know, like, <laughs> you love giving warnings, but you don't actually explain the truth first. You know what happens when you do that? People run away. Warnings are for those who can actually benefit from the truth first. Now what are the ways to the truth? The world around you, history, and revelation. Yes? Then the warning. See where the warning came? The warning is now, and it, now Allah is saying, when those three roads are blocked, doesn't matter how much you warn. They're just not going to believe. It's not going to matter. Doesn't that affect the way you talk to people about Islam? Doesn't it, shouldn't it be that we should emphasize right now the proper ways of thinking instead of just warning? And if you do want to warn people, what should you start with? The right way of thinking. Make them reflect on history. Make people reflect on revelation. Make people think about the world around them. And then give them a warning. I would argue that most Muslims today didn't have a formal or even a decent, halfway decent education in Islam, myself included. We don't. It's just the tragic world we live in. It's not our fault. So if we don't have the right foundation, and you come along and give a one hour lecture about the heat of hellfire, there's going to be a problem. Because the right foundation isn't there. The Prophets did not begin, they did not begin with warnings. They didn't begin like that. This is much later on in the game. So now let's talk about this ayah. You're only going to be able to warn the one who followed the reminder. Man dhikra. You know, when he uses the word man, someone, he's suggesting that maybe one z, two z you'll get. He doesn't, and, and the word man means someone who's unknown. If it was alladhi, like innama tunziru man tunziru alladhi taba'ad dhikra, then it would have been a known person. But man means an unknown person. In other words, the Prophet is talking to a large crowd, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and there's somebody in there, somebody in there. He doesn't even know who it is. And they start following what he's saying, and they're thinking about it. Now there's a difference between following the reminder and following the command. When you follow a command like prayer, you can see me praying. You could say, this person's following a command of Allah, yes? But when someone's sitting there following along what you're saying, can you tell what's going on in their head or no? The Prophet, no, I can't tell. I mean, some of you just do this because you're staying awake. Or you get really nervous, you think I'm looking at you because you have paranoia. You know? That's happened a lot. Like I was talking to that guy and this guy gets really scared because he thinks I'm looking at him. And, you know? <laughs> it happens. But I don't know what's going on in your head. Maybe you're thinking, oh my God, did I leave the stove open? Or you think, did I lock the car? You know? So, or some people think, what time does the game come on? Or, there's different things going on in your head. I don't know. The Prophet ﷺ has no idea what's going on in people's heads. And he's not supposed to know. Allah says, your only job is to, to warn the one who might have something going on in his head. مَنِ اتَّبَعَ الذِّكْرَ Look at the perfection of Allah's words. وَخَشِيَ rahman And he was afraid of Ar-Rahman. bil ghaib In the unseen. He was afraid of Ar-Rahman in the unseen. Why is the... Of course Ar-Rahman is in the unseen. So what does that mean in the unseen? Actually it means that he, is, he doesn't show his fear of Allah, of Ar-Rahman publicly. He shows it where? Privately. Which means you still won't know who he is because even when he does fear Allah, it's in the private. The Prophet ﷺ will have no idea that someone in the audience is becoming Muslim. No clue. He'll just hear, he just has to trust Allah. And now, think about the psychological impact of this. He's talking to a vast majority crowd that is aggressive against him. And somewhere in there, by his conviction, Allah has told him, someone in there is listening to you. And they've accepted, even though the whole crowd is against you. So you take that one person, فَبَشِّرْهُ بِمَغْفِرَةٍ وَأَجْرٍ كَرِيمٍ Congratulate that one person. Of, of, of forgiveness and congratulate them of noble compensation you know it's so so incredible that Allah Azza wa Jal in this ayah what he said the, f the first thing he offered is forgiveness 
You know why? Because if you're one of those people, and you listen to the Prophet have you lived a good life or a life of sin before? Sin before. You've lived a life of sin before. So as soon as you hear the truth, you start feeling guilty. And you feel like, man, I've made so many mistakes in my life. I wasted my whole life. What have I done? This even happens to Muslims. Muslims nowadays, sometimes somebody sends somebody a YouTube video, they watch it and go, oh my God, I'm so messed up. I need to make changes in my life. What have I done? And this guilt overtakes you. Doesn't it? And as soon as that happens, the Prophet is told to that crowd, to the one who does listen, I'm congratulating you. Forgiveness is yours. You get forgiveness. That's the first thing this person needs. It's done. It's in the past. Now you need to think ahead. But then the next problem comes. If I do move ahead, look at what's happening to this Prophet. Everybody makes fun of him. Everybody calls him a liar. Everybody calls him insane. The whole crowd is mad at him. If I follow him, what's going to happen to me? The same thing. They're going to think I'm part of the same cult. They're going to go after me. So I'll lose all my respect, isn't it? Like that Prophet used to be a respectable man until he became a Prophet and claimed to be a messenger. Now nobody respects him. So if I follow him, if they didn't spare him, who was the nicest man in the entire city, how are they going to spare me? The genius of the Qur'an. Congratulate him of forgiveness, which I already explained, and congratulate him of noble compensation, respectful compensation. Ajrin kareem. Why? Because now you shouldn't be looking for respect with people. Now you only have to be looking for respect with Allah. Your definition of where you find dignity and respect changes. You don't care what people think anymore. You're your own man now. You're your own woman now. The only dignity you want is from Allah. It freed you up from peer pressure. This one statement, you know what it did? You should have hope and you should not be afraid of people anymore. That's maghfiratin wa ajrin kareem. It's so beautiful. That's what this person needs more than anything else. فَبَشِّرْهُ بِمَغْفِرَةٍ وَأَجْرٍ كَرِيمٍ We're almost done. One last ayah. إِنَّا نَحْنُ نُحْيِ الْمَوْتَى No doubt about it. We, we're the ones who give life to the dead. Oh my God, what is that doing here? This entire conversation was not about life after death. This conversation was, was about warning most of the people who will never listen. How the Qur'an is so perfect, but that doesn't even matter. Very, very few, maybe one guy might listen. Isn't that the conversation? And all of a sudden, in the concluding commentary, we give life to the dead. Why? The first obvious answer that some commentators have given is that, of course, the warning is about life after death. So let's just culminate this passage with the warning itself. We're going to give life to the dead no matter what. Here's the warning itself. But I go a step further. I was telling you that the Quraysh, they've been, uh, they've been warned. They haven't been warned for many generations. They've been heedless. That's established. You could even argue some of them have their hearts are dead. Isn't it? And no matter how much the Prophet preaches to them, it doesn't seem to make any difference. Every day he talks to them, doesn't make any difference. But Allah tells him, I give life to the dead. Don't give up on people. It's not your job to bring them back to life, to bring them back to faith. That's mine. Your job is just to warn. You don't know whose heart may have been dead for years and one day Allah brings it back to life. You don't know when Umar might turn. You don't know when Hamza might turn. You don't know when Abu Sufyan might turn. It's not going to happen quickly. You don't know when Khalid ibn Walid might turn. It took years. It took battles. He killed Muslims before he became Muslim. I mean, seriously. That's not up to you. We, we're the ones who give life to the dead. What is the preacher, the messenger, and everyone after him, the da'i? What are they being reminded? I, and even the messenger, they don't change people. People don't change people. People don't revive people. Who does? Allah does. No video changed your life. Allah did. No speech changed your life. Allah did. My teacher used to describe this concept with kun fayakun. He used to say, a, a, a khatib, a speaker, a alim is giving a talk. Words are coming out of his mouth. They're going into people's ears. Everybody's hearing the same exact words. But for one of those people, Allah says, kun. And his life changes completely from one sentence. 
within the eight hours of yap, yap, yap. And that's not because of this person, it's because of Allah. We're the ones who give life to the dead. And those that are not listening, don't worry. It's not like they're getting away with what they're doing. وَنَكْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُوا وَآثَارَهُمْ We are writing down, we continue to write down the investments they've made. Everything you do is an investment into the future. Every time you do something bad, it is going into your future. وَآثَارَهُمْ And the, tr- the, the, the ruins they leave behind, the traces they leave behind. You know what this ayah is about? This ayah is about every day we are making history. The Quraysh are making history, they don't even know. They are leaving a legacy for the future and Allah is documenting it. And every day they are leaving a ruin wake behind them, a trail of ruin behind them that other people will learn from. And so as he concludes this passage, he says, وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامٍ مُبِينٍ And everything, everything they do. The Prophet ﷺ is being told, they don't get away with any of it. You know how Muslims get all frustrated? You know what they're doing nowadays? You know the video they just made? You know the campaign they just did? You know the attack they just did? You know this, you know that? Yeah, وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامٍ مُبِينٍ We're documenting all of it. And everything we have compiled it in perfect record. Ihsa actually means counting, like ancient counting used to be. You used to have a bottle and you put pebbles inside it. So that you never lose the count. Because if you count like this, you can mess up. But you put a pebble for every person, this is the perfect count. This is called Ihsa. He says, we've got perfect record of everything in a book that is wide open, that's going to be put right in front of them. Imam and Mubin. Imam comes from Amam, which means in front. A book that will be put right in front of you on Judgment Day will have every last thing perfectly documented. So don't you worry, they got away with nothing. From the beginning of the surah, the Prophet was being validated. You remember? The Prophet was being validated. By the end of this first passage, in this first section, of how many sections? Six sections. Alhamdulillah, the first and the longest one is done. Alhamdulillah. By the end of it, the Prophet is being given consolidation, consolation rather, consolation that their crimes are not going to go forgotten. They are, rec- they are recorded. They are being recorded. Barakallahu li walakum. Let's take a good, I'll make it 12 minutes. I'll be nice. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for watching these videos. If you'd like to continue to support Quran Weekly, please click the link in this video.